Hello, and welcome to another edition of Sri's Sunday New York Times Read Along. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We're also live on our Digimenters website. Thank you to Ian for letting us go live on his Facebook and Twitter accounts. And now a quick preview of today's show. This week on Sri's Sunday New York Times read along, award-winning columnist Ian O'Connor. Ian's new book, Coach K, about Duke basketball coach Mike Krzyzewski, comes out later this month. We'll ask Ian about his first day as a copy boy at the New York Times and about the time he met Reggie Jackson. We'll also review some of the highlights of his work, including an unbyline piece that got the attention of Frank DeFord, a column on the death of his brother, and pieces he wrote on Colin Kaepernick and Packers legend Bart Starr. And from this past week, we'll also talk about Brian Flores' suit against the NFL, citing discrimination against black coaches. Ian has written New York Times bestsellers on Bill Belichick, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, and Derek Jeter. We'll explore his writing process and the difference between authorized and unauthorized biographies. Oh, and Ian has covered several Olympics, so he'll have a thought or two on the Beijing Winter Games that started this week. After a short break at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Time, Melissa Lutke and Lori Mifflin will join us to offer a tribute to Robin Herman, one of the first female journalists to enter a men's professional sports locker room in North America. Robin passed away earlier this week. Every week, we review the print edition of the Sunday New York Times, taking audience comments and interviewing special guests. The show is produced by Digimenters, we produce high-quality virtual and hybrid events for organizations big and small around the world. We also do social and digital consulting, training, and workshops. I am the executive producer of the show, Neil Parrett. Our production team includes Paula Kiger, Steve Taylor, Julia Weeks, and Carla Baranakis. Our host, of course, is Sri Srinivasan. Ian O'Connor is our guest live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimenters website. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are in for a great show today. Uh, Ian O'Connor is going to talk about uh, all sorts of topics, particularly his book, Coach K., about uh, Duke basketball coach Mike Krzyzewski. We'll talk about the difference between authorized and unauthorized biographies. We'll also cover some uh, news uh, from the last week, including Brian Flores' lawsuit against the NFL. Uh, and of course, there are the Olympics uh, as well. Ian has covered, as you saw, uh, several Olympics uh, over the, the years. Uh, so we wanna uh, go ahead and uh, welcome some of the folks watching uh, online. Uh, our friend uh, uh, Rahavian is watching from uh, Central Region Long, Long Island. Um, thank you. And, and he makes a good point. He may not be able to watch all of it, but you can watch it on replay whenever you want on the same links where you're watching now. Uh, Jonathan is watching from the East Village. Jonathan, Jonathan, always great to see you. Linda Lawrence from Long Island. Doug Levy from California. Patricia Freudenberg watching from uh, New York. My mom. Hi, Mom. Watching from Tampa, Florida. Um, and uh, Miriam Berkeley is watching uh, from Hell's Kitchen, uh, New York. Uh, so with that, let's uh, go ahead and bring on uh, Sri Srinivasan uh, to get this show uh, started. Sri, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Great to be here with you, Neil. You've been substituting for me and doing a fantastic job as a guest host. But of Thank course, you. you and the team do a, a great job every week putting the show together. I'm so excited to have Ian with us today. Uh, we have so many people watching. Apollo is watching from sunny Philadelphia. Carla, who helps produce the show, is watching and says, Ian doesn't age. He looks the same as he did when they first met 30 years ago. And uh, Mike says, 
you two had better be interesting. So Mike, uh, uh -oh. Mike is a great uh, sports writer himself, and uh, we want to. He just wrote. He's written a big book on Kobe Bryant that is just yes, from, uh, Mike Zielski. And uh, we know that there's so much news in the world. Please tell us how your Sunday is going. Tell us where you're watching from. We want to hear from you and hear everything that's uh, going on on your Sunday. There, we also want to acknowledge that uh, Doug, who's watching from California, it means it's 5.30 in the morning. And Doug has been a guest on the show and he's done a really good job with us, being with us so many Sundays at 5.30. And that's really nice when he's able to join us. And he did our show at 5.30 in the morning as a guest himself, which was pretty Pretty cool. Uh, we want to tell everyone that we do this every Sunday and we appreciate your time with us. You can, if you're watching live or later, one thing you can do to help us right now is hit retweet or share or tag somebody who cares about the news, who's interested in what's happening in the world. They can watch us live or later. You're going to learn so much from Ian this morning. So that's going to be fun as well. Uh, we do want to uh, say hello to our team. We mentioned Carla Baranakis already. Uh, Paula Kiger is watching from Tallahassee. Steve Taylor is in Philly. Julia is in Brooklyn, Julia Weeks. And it's so much fun to work with all of you to put this show together. And uh, Doug says it's normal wake up time for him at 530. I think some of us gentlemen, as we get a little older, wake up earlier and earlier. And uh, <laughs> Naomi says, Upper West Side in the house, you guys are always amazing. So what we're gonna do is do a quick tour of the paper and then bring Ian in as, as fast as we can. And there's Michael holding us to high standards. So thank you, Michael. And uh, let's start by just showing you the view from my window. Uh, as we see the Upper West Side, it's very cold in New York City uh, today. Uh, unfortunately, but uh, you will be able to uh, see New York City in just a minute. Go ahead, Neil. As, as Sri is getting ready to uh, put that up, I uh, want to also make a reference, uh, make sure you know about Digimentors, uh, the, um, and this is the, the, right, the updated slide, Digimentors, we produce high quality virtual and hybrid events uh, for organizations big and small. Uh, we do social and digital consulting, uh, produce live events uh, like this. If you're interested in working with us, uh, give us an, send us an email, sri at digimentors.group uh, or neil at digimentors.group, and we'd love to work with you. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, check out the um, uh, the view from uh, out the window. Yeah, I, yeah. Look, look how nice the Hudson River looks in New Jersey. Carla is somewhere on that side of the river, and. It's basically about 17 degrees Fahrenheit here, minus seven degrees Celsius at the moment. And uh, it's a beautiful day and we're gonna talk about the paper. So let's get started. Absolutely. Here is the front page of the New York Times. Uh, lots about the Olympics, including flirting with disaster. We'll ask Ian about what his opinions are about whatever's happening in uh, Beijing right now. Huge casualties feared in Russia if if Russia seizes the Ukraine, a fatal shove on the subway and a broken mental health system, revolving door from treatment to streets. This is, of course, a big nightmare for anybody who goes on the subway, this idea that there are people who might push you. And death of a child unites Morocco in grief, an unusual story about a four-day rescue operation failed to save a boy who plunged down a hundred-foot well. Some of you who remember there was a big story about a baby named Baby Jessica who fell down a well but survived back in the 1980s. And New York's hospitals emerge from resilient, re emerge in resilient from the Omicron wave. So that's good to know because all the stories about American hospitals, especially New York hospitals have been terrible. So I'm glad to hear that. And look at this exotic butterflies and a wild conspiracy theory. I'm really curious what this is. I'm a big fan of butterflies wherever they are in the world, but I really want to know what this uh, this uh, conspiracy theory is. So this is something to do with right-wing conspiracy theories online. They say that these, these uh, butterfly, there's a butterfly center on the border and it's a cover for human smuggling and exploitation of children. So uh, if it's coming from Steve Bannon, you know it's completely BS. And of course it does come from Steve Bannon. And Chris Gorman says, hi. Hello, Chris, great friend of the show and great friend of mine. So that's the front page. We'll see, uh, look at the, the way this works. There's an ad for Pol Polo, which uh, outfits 
the with Team USA and they have a whole section of polo. And I haven't seen what the uh, feedback is. There are people always unhappy with how uh, some of the uniforms turn out, but this looks pretty good. And this is a Aja or a a a a Evans from bobsledding. And those of you watching will know more. Ian's watching from Ottawa. Ian, thank you so much for watching. Uh, Canada is a country that always does well in the Olympics, obviously. The Metropolitan uh, section. Eric from Ottawa, just to. Hi, Eric. How are Ian, you? Ian's our guest today. Yes, of course. <laughs> Uh, I have Ian on my mind, clearly. Uh, zip tied and left for dead, an Episcopal priest mysterious end. This is the Metropolitan section, which only goes to print sec uh, subscribers in the New York City area. So many people will not see it, even if you get the paper. And Liz says, gorgeous views, uh, four degrees in the Berkshires this AM, staying bundled inside. So perfect day to watch with us, Liz. And if you have a friend who might be interested in Ian or the New York Times uh, or the news in general, please tell them about us. A messenger reinvents himself as a street musician. This is about Sam Pritchard. Let's see, the book review cover is Flipping the Script, Kingdom of Characters, the Language Revolution That Made China Modern. I definitely want to read this book. And we want to remind everybody that Ian's here in part to talk about his big new book. And that's about, uh, about the coach of the legendary coach at Duke University's basketball team. And look at some of the great reviews here. In this insightful biography, sports writer O'Connor captures the formative experiences and inner drive that catapulted the coach to icon status. Even the most diehard fans will learn something. And that was in the Washington Post and Bill Plaschke, longtime LA Times sports columnist says, no journalist alive is better than Ian Connor at pulling back the curtain on the inner workings of the great unknowable sports figure. And he's done it again with Coach K, an enduring masterpiece. Wow, Ian, we'll be talking to you about the book, but I know you love that review. Uh, that's awesome. All right, the Arts and Leisure cover is Apocalypse Whatever, Don't from Don't Look Up to Search Party, we're awash in parables and warnings. But global warming is outpacing our emotional capacity to describe it. Amanda Hess's uh, essay here, but look at the artwork, there's a snail watching while the world is on fire here. The New York Times Magazine cover is the battle to control the world's most powerful cyber weapon. So I wanna know what that's all about. The real estate section has a cover is buyer's remorse, frantic purchases of home during the pandemic produced regrets and hindsight. And the sports cover, we will be talking about fear. Fear, faster, higher, scarier. And the Sunday review cover is In Good Faith, the crisis in the evangelical community has created an opportunity for renewal, the chance to build a church that, li that lives by its values by David Brooks. And uh, Sunday Styles cover is Who Me, a star, the actress Rena Renate, or Renate, Renat, uh, Reinsev, uh, stepping reluctantly into the spotlights, finds celebrity to be a challenge and resorts face skiers frustrations. And finally, Sunday business is time for a victory lap. This is Stephanie Kelton's ideas on deficit spending were proving true. Then came inflation. She's a proponent of the modern monetary theory. And the Fox News that Donald Trump, Trump helped build. Early on, Roger Ailes welcomed forces that redefined political discourse. And of course, they were thinking a lot about CNN with the crisis that it's going through with its version of Roger Ailes stepping down in Jeff Zucker. So we'll be talking all about that. I think we're ready now to welcome our friend Ian O'Connor. And so we're going to say hi to Ian and bring him on. Hello, Ian. Welcome. What's up, Jeffrey? How are you? Good to see you. Thanks for patiently listening to all of that as we went through the paper. I am so delighted to have you here. My first question is always, how are you? Where are you? And how has the pandemic treated you and your family? Well, I'm in northern New Jersey, Sri, and the pandemic, well, at the beginning of it, in the spring of two years ago, we, we went through a very difficult stretch. My brother, unfortunately, uh, died unexpectedly. And that was right before the pandemic really hit. And our family attended services for him, obviously. And, and really, if you recall, the night that America changed was the night that Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz tested positive and 20,000 people from that NBA game were sent home. Well, that morning, 
we had the uh, funeral for my brother and the reception. And that was really the last day in America you could gather before the storm. And so from that service, we believe anyway that a number of us uh, were infected with the with the virus. And so we got through it. My sister had it far worse than I did. She she was touch and go in the hospital for, for a long time. My wife had a, a fairly bad case of it. I did as well. So so we all got through it. And a lot of American families had it and families around the world had it far worse than we did and had family members who didn't survive. So we're all grateful and thankful that uh, that was the outcome, at least here. Tell me about this column you wrote. Well, that was uh, the last trip I ever took with my brother uh, before he he passed away. And it just that's the first time and this is the Masters in 2019 and the greatest golfer of all time, Tiger Woods, won that Masters, of course, in a, in a great comeback. And that's the first time I ever actually had a ticket to the Masters outside of my credential. I had covered 20 uh, Masters tournaments. So I had a ticket and I decided, let me give it to my brother who uh, my only brother and uh, was a great big brother to me uh, growing up. And so that's the first time he ever attended a major golf championship. And we walked around. I'll never forget on that Sunday, as it became clear that Tiger was going to win. I said to him, you've never been to a major before. You are now witnessing the greatest masters and maybe the greatest golf tournament of all time. So he got a kick out of that. And he was healthy at the time. So it was unexpected that he died. And I'm just grateful that we had that opportunity to spend that time together our last trip and to see Tiger Woods pull that off at his age after all the comebacks and different things he had to overcome. That was a a moment that I will cherish forever. So I felt moved to write about it, what that meant to me, what that meant to him. And I think the enduring, I guess, opinion or narrative thread weaving through that column is that, that sports really can, can move people, bring people together and have a, a great impact uh, on you. And, and that tournament certainly did. Yeah, and uh, that was April of 2019. And less than a year later, your brother would have passed on. So I, I can't uh, imagine the, how proud you are that you were able to give him that moment and to be there. And you're right, that was one of the greatest comebacks we've seen in sports. And I'm a big fan of the Tiger Woods game. And of course, he went on, Tiger Woods himself went on to have major issues after that. And so do you think he will play in the Masters this year? Will he have a career? We didn't expect him to be, might even not be able to walk again, but he has played with his son, which is also touching to see. Sri, I think it's more likely he would play in July at the the British Open in St. Andrews. That's his favorite course in the world, right right along with Augusta National. I don't think he'll be physically ready to compete in April. I think that's asking for too much after his accident and the uh, his leg almost being amputated. And uh, although he looked pretty good to me when he played with his son, Charlie, at the father-son in December, I, I think Augusta National is one of the more difficult walks in, in all of golf. So as much as he would love to tee it up, at the Masters, I, I, I think that St. Andrews in July is a more realistic target. Thank you. And Paula has put in a link to your column so people can find it and read about this. And uh, and Patricia says, deep, sending deepest condolences. May his legacy live on forever. Uh, thank you thank very you. much, uh, Patricia, for sharing that. I have to ask, you know, when you speak about great athletes, it's sometimes hard to uh, think of them and not think of the non-sports things that they have done that have gotten them in trouble. So let me ask you, at the moment, obviously, uh, uh, Novak Djokovic is Djokovic is who I think about with everything that he has done. I'm a big fan of his game. How do I separate him, That how do I separate the game from his awful behavior during the pandemic? And not just about the vaccine, as you know, he's also against women's equality in pay and has uh, believes in all kinds of weird science things as well? That's a great question, Sri. I think that you could, you could ask that question about entertainers and politicians who've gotten themselves in trouble with scandalous behavior. And can you appreciate the art, what they have provided American culture in terms of a performance or, or in politics in terms of leadership? And what do you do with their personal flaws? And I think 
Djokovic is probably the greatest tennis player who ever lived. I would have said that about Federer, maybe Nadal a few years ago, but Djokovic, I think, even though Nadal now has the record with 21 majors, I think Djokovic will end up sort of having that unofficial greatest of all time trophy when he's done. But he cost himself an opportunity to break the record himself with what I thought was a silly decision to, to not get vaccinated and, and compete. He made that decision. And in a sense, in the historical chase with Federer and Nadal, he was his own worst enemy there. But I think that it's very difficult. I get asked that question a lot about great athletes, great politicians and leaders, performers, entertainers. And how do we separate personal misdeeds and flaws from the great achievements in the public arena? And I think that's up to the individual whether or not you can make that separation. I try to do that as much as I can. And for instance, I have a, a Hall of Fame vote in baseball, and I do vote for Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. That's a little different because you can argue their misdeeds really enhance their performance on the field. And I'm voting for those players to, to go into the Hall of Fame and to achieve a certain degree of baseball immortality. But in general, I, I do try to appreciate the art of, say, a Novak Djokovic, while understanding this is far from a perfect human being and maybe put their flaws in a separate box. Okay, so just to uh, just to be clear, you did vote, and you have been voting every year. You're part of that 50 to 60% of voters who vote for Barry Bonds, as well as, uh, uh, as uh, Sam, you for Sammy Sosa and, and Mark McGuire. No, uh, I actually, three, I did not vote for those two because I do impose, this is just my personal decision, a penalty on baseball players who I believe used PEDs. And, and that penalty is, I'm not going to completely rule you out, but you have to be the greatest of the great. And by the uh, people who follow analytics in baseball understand the, the war measurement. And by that measurement, Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds are two of the eight greatest players who ever lived. Sosa, McGuire, and others who use PEDs, in my opinion, fall below that standard. So I'm going to raise the bar very high for you if you were found to have cheated, if the overwhelming evidence says you did cheat, but I won't rule you out. And I think Clemens and Bonds being in the top eight all time to ever play the game, I think they they pass that test. And I'll also say that Barry Bonds had a great career before he started taking the right. steroids. You could see him blow up, including his head and his body change. You remember that gangly kid who just used to hit home runs and was was great to watch as well. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is Ian O'Connor, and he's got a great new book behind him. You can see it, Coach K, uh, the book about the life and times of, Co of Coach Krzyzewski, the legendary coach of Duke basketball, men's basketball, also the Olympics. And we'll talk about the book in, in just a bit. Uh, one thing I want to uh, say that uh, people who have complicated names like I do, we're always amazed how Americans can pronounce Krzyzewski's name, or do you remember Zygmunt Brzezinski, but they see a Srinivasan and they freeze. And that tells you something that they're willing to make, take the trouble if you're truly great. Well, yeah, there's no question about that. And by the way, Mike Krzyzewski, his name in looking, when he played basketball at West Point, you go back and look in newspapers in box scores, old box scores when Army would play Navy and other teams. And it, I have to say the New York Times was in there as well. His name was misspelled so many different ways. It's rather humorous. And when he was introduced at Duke University in 1980 as the head coach, he actually spelled his name at the press conference. So, yeah, that's a name that has given a lot of people a lot of trouble over the years. Carla asks, Ian, how do you feel about Pete Rose? Pete Rose, I was a proponent. There's there's so much misbehavior there as a player. Obviously, there's no question. I think I'm generally Carla in favor. And he he's he does pass the test as far as being among the greatest of the great. There's no question about that. But it's it, with him, it's not just the betting on baseball. There are other issues that he was involved with that give me pause. I do believe this. He should have been on the ballot and the baseball writer should have had the opportunity to make that decision. And, and that was not the case because he was on the ineligible list. So he was never on the ballot while I was a voter. But that would have been a very difficult one for me. I, I think I might have gotten to a point where I did vote for him, but I would have liked to at least have had that opportunity. And I did not. 
Uh, Patricia says congrats on your book release and Paula is giving us information on the book. So let's talk a little bit about the book. And as, as you know, our audience is international. Not everybody follows American college men's basketball. So first, situate men's basketball in the American sports and entertainment culture. And then uh, uh, kind of situate Duke and Mike uh, Krzyzewski, please. Well, in, in American sport, college basketball does not rank uh, with, say, the National Football League or, or perhaps certainly the NBA and Major League Baseball. Uh, but it is, uh, and, and really one of the reasons now, I actually think it was more prominent years ago when you saw college basketball players stay in school for four years. So you, you witnessed rivalries develop. You saw players really, their personalities develop over time. You got to know them. Now, most great college basketball players go right to professional basketball in the United States after one year of, of school, and that's it. So, so the game has changed, but Mike Krzyzewski is as legendary a coach in any sport as we've had in my lifetime. I think you could put Bill Belichick there, uh, the dynastic coach of the New England Patriots, and a few others, but Coach K's records are staggering and uh, to do it at uh, Duke University uh, for 42 years and to change with the times the way he did in American college basketball. Again, it used to be where most of the great players stayed for at least three years, if not four. And for him to adapt the way he did to what we call the one and done era of college basketball and recruit star players in high school and find a way to reach them, connect with them and inspire them in one season before they leave for professional basketball and still do that at a high level as he approaches age 75, that's a, that's a pretty impressive thing to have pulled off and, and he's done it better than anybody. Tell me a couple of lessons that people will get from the book if they're not 100% uh, fans of Duke or Duke basketball or, uh, or follow uh, Coach K himself. Well, Sri, even if you're not a sports fan or a college basketball fan, it's really about a human being and it's about leadership. And it's also in, in many ways a true American dream story because his father and, and mother, they were the, the children of, of Polish immigrants and basically went through the Ellis Island experience in America. His father changed his name from Krzyzewski to Cross because of discrimination that he faced that his family faced and uh, was concerned about employment and educational opportunities being denied his children. And so when Mike and his big brother, Bill went to school, they, uh, his parents did not want them to take any Polish language courses, did not want them to have any accents. And it, it was a decision that Mike made to keep the name Krzyzewski. He had an uncle, a police officer named Uncle Joe in Chicago who, who told him at an early age, don't change your name. That's who you are. But, and he didn't, but his father did. If you look at his father's obituary in 1969 in the Chicago Tribune, it's under cross, not Krzyzewski. Krzyzewski's in brackets, I believe. And, and so Mike Krzyzewski lived that experience. I think as a blue collar kid in Chicago grew up, uh, was really shaped by that experience at his parents. His mother was a cleaning lady. His father was an elevator operator and later a tavern owner. Basically, they labored for wealthy people. And, and Mike, I think, was raised under the belief that people are going to try to take things away from you. Don't let them and fight for a better life. And I think that's basically what he did. Wow. So, so amazing to hear that backstory about Mike Krzyzewski. Uh, and I'm so glad that you're able to tell that in this book. So everyone, please check out Coach K, the, the rise and reign of Mike Krzyzewski, the coach at Duke Basketball. Look at these great uh, reviews. Uh, tell us about Bill Plaschke. He's such a character. I presume you know him well. And he, call, he says, no journalist alive is better than you at pulling back the curtain of the inner workings of the great unknowable sports figure. And he says that because you wrote a big book about Bill Belichick and others. We had in that book on Belichick and, and trying to write a, a book, an unauthorized biography of Belichick and the New England Patriots. It's like trying to do the same thing with the Kremlin. And <laughs> I think American football fans understand that. But Bill Plasky is one of the greatest sports writers ever. And I certainly wouldn't say that about myself. So for him to say that about this book and about me is, is one of the greatest compliments 
I, I could ever receive. But uh, he's a terrific personality on TV, on ESPN, around the horn. But uh, beyond that, he's just a tremendous, not just a, a sports writer, but just a journalist. He tells sure. human stories as effectively as any sports news or feature writer in the country. So, so I was uh, very proud to, to see that he said that about the book and, and about me. And we should note that this is the final year of Coach K. My daughter is at Duke, and she's not a sports fan, but she became a Duke basketball fan as a freshman because she has no choice. And I told her, you're so lucky that you get to uh, be there that final year. People are flying in from around the country to watch him. And even people who haven't gone to the school are there. Ian, you were telling me that uh, tickets for sale go up as high as $80,000 for a college sports team, partly because of Bell uh, of, uh, of uh, Krzyzewski's last year. Uh, let's see. Chris Gorman uh, says, can't wait to check it out. Ian, your book on Bill Belichick is a great read. And we see Thanks. some of the other books there, Arnie and Jack, and The Captain, The Journey of Derek Jeter. I know Neil would have loved talking to you all about that, as, the, as would Chris, because big, big uh, Yankee fans here. And uh, we should note Bill Belichick is part of the story this week because Tom Brady retired. So talk about that a little bit and that relationship. And where do you come down on the, the argument who, who is better or is that a stupid argument? Well, <laughs> that's not a stupid argument. That's, that's what sports fans do. That's the beauty of sport is having those debates. Who's the greatest of all time? Is it Michael Jordan or LeBron James and, or Kobe Bryant? By the way, Mike Sealski is, is listening, or at least he was a while ago, and he wrote a tremendous book about Kobe Bryant, The Rise. So, so please pick that up as well. And Mike's one of the, one of the greatest in the country uh, at the same time as Plasky. So, uh, but as as far as Brady and Belichick go, Brady's now in the lead, right? Because he won a Super Bowl with Tampa Bay, so he now has seven championships to Belichick six as a head coach. You can argue though, Belichick won two as an assistant coach with the Giants, so maybe his ring total is really eight at the end of the day. But I, I wrote a book on Belichick, not Brady, so I might be a little biased. You, you could argue certainly that the player on the field is always more important than the coach, but Belichick built such an impressive system there. And I know there are coaches who believe that I'm not saying he could have won six Super Bowls with any quarterback in the NFL or any good quarterback in the NFL, but there are others I think he would have won multiple titles with. And that program that he, that he built there, the, the day-to-day -day attention, the detail, the intensity in the offseason, the regular season and postseason never changes. Every day in that facility at that stadium is treated like game seven of the World Series. And, and that could be in, in the middle of May, long before the season starts. So the, the fact that he was able to construct that program, he, he did get lucky that he found a player in Tom Brady late in the draft, the 199th pick overall in 2000. And he turned out to be certainly the, the greatest football player ever. But, but Belichick shaped him into that. And, and I think people forget that. Here was a guy who was a defensive coach, and he created the, the biggest offensive juggernaut pro, pro football has ever seen. So he deserves credit for that. I, I guess I would give the slight edge to the coach who was responsible for the entirety of the team and program. But a lot of people after Brady won championship number seven with Tampa Bay would would give him the nod. And I think that's probably a very credible argument to make. All right. So then for the next question, we're going to just take a, take a one, you know, one name answer. Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, greatest American team athlete of all time. Michael Jordan by a hair. And that's, I presume, because it's you control much more of the game in a five person team than you do on a. 11 person team, 50 person team as they do. In well, it's three, right. He's playing defense. Tom Brady doesn't. It's really close. And Brady has seven and Michael Jordan had six. If he hadn't taken that sabbatical to play baseball, maybe he has eight, but he, but he ended up with six. So you can go with Brady, but, and also as an athlete, there, there was a greater demand on, on Michael Jordan's athleticism playing the shooting guard position in the NBA, as opposed to quarterback in the NFL. And I just, I look at it. It, it's in my lifetime, the greats that I've covered, there's really three that separate themselves from everybody else. And it's Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods and Tom Brady. I, I think you're splitting hairs. But if you 
made me go with one, I would go with Michael Jordan. All right. Pradnya is going with Serena Williams. So that's nice. And Pradnya uh, says, oh, oh, Mike says hey, your check is in the mail. So that's good. So he is watching. <laughs> <laughs> and he dared us to be interesting, by the way. And uh, Paul has put in a link to Mike's book as well. It's uh, called, it's a book about Kobe Bryant. Uh, Pradnya says, I once got to watch a uh, University of uh, Kansas basketball practice with Coach Cal, in my opinion. Uh, what makes these coaches great is their ability to train and motivate what are essentially child athletes. Talk a little bit about that. Miriam also asked, what makes a great coach? Good question. Uh, I will say, too, I'm glad your daughter has experience of being at Duke in, in Coach K's final season. I took my wife, Tracy. To, she had never been to Cameron Indoor Stadium. So we went recently to the Clemson game. We sat six rows from the top of the building, and it felt like there's no bad seat in that in that stadium so we were right on top of the court we only paid 250 dollars a ticket i think on StubHub, but the uh, ticket cost for that final game against north carolina the most expensive one i saw was eighty thousand dollars i think the cheapest was about 3500 but what makes a, a great coach is the ability to communicate and connect with people from, from all different backgrounds and and to inspire those people to do things that maybe they didn't believe they could do. And I think Coach K has done that over the years. And as a communicator, he has, in talking to hundreds of people for this book, he has the ability to, when you're sitting with him one-on-one, -on -one, make you feel like you're the only other person in the world. And that's whether you are a CEO of a Fortune 500 company or you're a 17-year-old kid from a challenging background. His communication skills are off the charts and his motivational skills, probably his greatest strength as a coach, and Sri, I talked to a lot of uh, college coaches who compete against him and who have the greatest respect for him who say, you know what, as an offensive strategist, that's, Mike's not very strong, but that's actually an area of weakness. And so he's very good defensively on that side of the ball, but he's the best motivator maybe of, of all time. So covers, if you want to call that a weakness, on the offensive side of the ball, but not the greatest strategist in the world. But, man, everything else that he brings to the table, particularly his ability to motivate and communicate and connect with teenage athletes, is uh, really, I think, what separates him from the pack. All right. We have to get to the newspaper, but I do want to ask you one more sports story of the week, and that's Brian Flores, the Miami Dolphins coach who had two very successful seasons before he was fired. He uh, has... Uh, sued the NFL and there's been some stories about uh, one of his allegations is that he was offered money, a bounty to lose games. And so there's a lot going on there. Even Bill Belichick figures in this story because he sent a congratulatory text to Brian about getting the Giants job before he got the, before he even interviewed, meaning it looked like he confused two Brian's and the other Brian who was white, Brian, uh, this Brian is black. So for people not following it, just situate the story for us. Right. Even for people around the world, uh, American professional football has a, a very big problem. 70% of the players are, are black. And there's one head coach out of 32 right now who is, who is black. That's Mike Tomlin in Pittsburgh, who's been there a long time, one of the best coaches in the league. And there, there's a rule in place that requires NFL teams when interviewing candidates for the general manager's position and head coach position to interview a certain number of uh, minority candidates. It's called the Rooney Rule, but the Rooney Rule doesn't work. And these teams are interviewing uh, African-American and other minority candidates and generally not hiring them. So something needs to change. Brian Flores was the head coach, a successful one of the Miami Dolphins, beat Belichick four times in three years in, in Miami with a roster that wasn't very talented and didn't have a talented or top quarterback and found a way to do that. He got fired after three years. And he was a candidate for the open position with the New York Giants. He, he finished, I believe, second in the Derby, lost to Brian Dable, a very qualified candidate who happens to be white. And he filed a, a class action suit against the NFL and three individual teams, including the Giants, alleging racism and discrimination. So Brian Flores is uh, from Brownsville, Brooklyn, very proud of that, and a, a tough guy who's not afraid. He doesn't back down to anything, never has in his life. He's a very talented gifted coach. He deserves an opportunity certainly to be a head coach right away. Should not have been fired, in my opinion, in Miami. But it does seem in the NFL that black coaches 
don't get as much time as white coaches to produce. They don't get second jobs as quickly as white coaches do. It's a, it's a real problem. And Brian Flores' lawsuit is bringing that problem into the spotlight. And I think ultimately that's a good thing. Thank you. I'm a big fan of the Rooney rule because I have seen what it has done. At one point, there were seven or eight coaches. And so it worked at that time. And I brought that into my work as a manager, as a leader at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where I ran the digital department. Because of the Rooney rule, uh, our borrowing the idea behind it that you always have to have a minority, especially as a finalist, I was able to hire the very first black woman, black man and Hispanic man in the history of my department. So I was very proud of it. But as I say now, it is failing the coaches and that's terrible. And I think you agree as well. And that's what you said, Ian. So this is where it shows you that sports transcends sports. It transcends uh, just the kind of narrow lanes that we think about. And the Rooney family out of uh, Pittsburgh and a great uh franchise that they have there have the only black coach still in the in the NFL we were hoping there would be you know there were eight openings this year we hope there would be multiple uh black coaches selected and they're they're going to be shut out basically zero for eight and Neil is writing about this as well and say uh I, I wrote this I wrote about this several years ago uh Sri, when I worked at uh, United Way just to amplify your point that it goes beyond sports I thought about the idea that United Way should institute a nonprofit version of the Rooney Rule because United Way uh, as well had a problem with hiring uh, minority uh, CEOs, uh, CEOs of color, et cetera. So okay. it's, your point is uh, you know, right, right on point, Sri. Thank you. All right, we've got to move on because we only have 45 minutes to talk about the entire New York Times, Ian, and we're going to get to it. But uh, just a, one more reminder to everyone that Ian's book drops on February 22nd, and it's called Coach K, The Rise and Reign of Mike Krzyzewski. And uh, you can get it. You can pre-order it everywhere that you get your favorite books. And we always, of course, recommend independent bookstores if you can uh, find one near you or online. All right, let's talk about the news and the newspaper. And I am going into the New York Times camera so we can show you what's happening on the front page. We start with the Olympics. And Ian, what we'll do is as I look through the paper, just jump in with anything you'd like to say. Obviously, I want you to talk about the Olympics as a start. Well, I've covered four, and it is uh, the most challenging event to cover as a sports journalist, just logistically and everything. It's also the most rewarding. And I know some people have asked, well, why are the Olympic Games going on in Beijing, in China, of all places? And I, 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 I'm a, of a belief that the Games should go on, really, almost at, at almost any cost. I just think that international competition really highlights what we have in common as opposed to highlighting what divides us. And, and I think sport actually does a lot of good. I'm glad the games are going on. And so, uh, but it is a, uh, it is a hell of a challenge, frankly, to cover uh, the Olympic games, at least the way I did where I was covering three events a day and just trying to get from one place to the other. But the stories that you get to tell about athletes around the world are really profound. And so I'm glad I had the opportunity to cover four and frankly, I, I wish I, I was in China right now because uh, there's nothing quite like covering the Olympic Games. One of your previous guests, one of our previous guests who sat in your chair, not literally at your home, but uh, is John Branch. And he has this incredible cover story in the New York Times uh, sports section. And I know you know John and his work, Pulitzer Prize winner, amazing oh, journalist. John. John is amazing. He really is. And this is right in his wheelhouse. And the thing about fear and Olympic athletes, particularly at the Winter Games, and just being there and seeing the speed uh, that that comes into play with with the skiing events, with bobsledding, with speed skating, and it, it is it is dangerous. But the athletes I've talked to over the years, and I found this story fascinating, when they're talking about physical injury, I, I've heard them say that their greater fear really is is not so much the physical injury itself, but what that does to four years of training, and and it could absolutely ruin it and take you out of the competition and your chance at immortality and winning a, a gold medal or any medal. And I found that athletes at the winter and, and summer games had that fear as well. That was very palpable to them that it's not just the injury, 
it's what the injury means to four years of preparation basically going out the window. And we know from watching lots of sports that some people enjoy the thrill of defeat. You remember that famous video of the uh, ski jumper falling on his face as he goes down in the opening of worldwide uh, wide world of sports. Uh, what have you seen in terms of bravery in, in athletics uh, or in any sport that you've covered, which performance stands out to you as something that you'll never forget someone who laid it out all on the field and then still carried on. Well, there are so many stories at the Olympics and any people who've overcome things in war torn countries that, that really strike me. I remember being at the ceremony in uh, Sydney, the first uh, gold medal won by, by an Israeli athlete and the flag going up at that ceremony. And it was really moving just because it's hard not to go back to Munich in 72 and what happened there with the, uh, the murders of the uh, Israeli athletes. And so people were crying. It was very emotional. And when I think of the Olympics, and frankly, every time I see the, the flag of, of Israel, I think of that moment and just what that meant to, to people. And so I, I would say that, that's the, the most profound ceremony I, I've witnessed, really event I've witnessed. And I've covered games the Salt Lake Games after 9-11 and the, the tension surrounding those games w was very uh, palpable. And, and even going to, to Athens in 2004, which was three years removed from 9-11, but I remember saying to my wife when I left, that's the only time I've ever had that conversation with her where I said, if something happens to me, just do the right thing in raising our kid. And, and, and don't worry. I, I think that is the only time I've ever had a conversation like that because there was some anti-American sentiment uh, in, in Greece and Athens at the time, and I felt it over there. And uh, I, I felt like that was the first big international event where a lot of Americans were traveling uh, after 9-11. So, so, but the, to me, the, the stories of the games are the, the triumphs of the individual athletes generally representing war-torn countries and what they've overcome that have struck me the most. Thank you. Here's a, a New York City political point. Macron says badminton is an Olympic sport played in New York City by all ages, genders, but not recognized by New York City parks and recs and schools to allow this opportunity for Asian American assimilation. That's interesting. I did not know that. Uh, it's obviously a sport that's been played on the East Coast for decades, you know, a century probably. I, I know people who play uh, in old Boston clubs play badminton, white people who play. So I'm surprised that that's the case here. But that's the thing where we talk about sports. You never know what's happening. OK, let's move on to a non-sports story. January 6th committee borrows tactics of a pr prosecution. Nearly 500 witnesses, an aggressive approach, tries to push Garland to pursue Trump. I want to make a point here that uh, Ross Douthat, New York Times columnist, was the subject of my newsletter in last week, where he basically said, there's nothing to see here. His columns are almost always nothing to see here. And I called it Ross Douthat's white guy confidence. And he's saying, basically, let's not invent a civil war where there isn't one. Nothing big's happening. Don't worry about it, folks. And that's got me really upset. And you know, I love the New York Times. But uh, reading uh, his work was just, this was the final straw for me. But you can find my newsletter at Substack. It's srinet.substack.com. Would love for folks to subscribe and send me feedback. And if you're a Ross Douthat fan or you're Ross Douthat, let me know what you thought of the column. And I want to hear from you. And it's srinet.substack.com. Ian, do you have a newsletter? Everybody else in the world does. No, I'm the, I'm the last one to to not uh, have a newsletter, I, I guess. <laughs> so I'm too busy writing books and and writing columns to uh, to put together a newsletter. So so no. So I, count I, it out. I understand that. What about Wordle? Everybody's playing Wordle. Um, I, I again, I'm, I'm the last man standing or not standing in in that regard too. So <laughs> so no. Uh, oh, we should point out, yeah, that Wordle was bought this past week by. The New York Times for uh, they say low seven figures, so I presume between one and seven million, one and five million dollars or so. And uh, it, it was a it was a game written by uh, created by a uh, a guy for his girlfriend during the pandemic, and he turned out it turned out pretty well. Uh, See, I, was, I was actually very uh, I was fascinated by the Times acquisition of the Athletic. Mm -hmm. 
the sports site. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how that develops over time. And the athletic is, is a great site. If you're, if you're aware of it or not, it, it's a site of uh, basically it, it's very much like ESPN.com, some tremendous writers and editors and, and the times just recently purchased it. So uh, I'm fascinated to see that, that relationship, what it does to the athletic and what it does to the, the times and its coverage of sports. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan and I subscribe, and especially because I can read Rich Deitch's column in there. That's the only place I can find my former student, Rich, uh, Richard Deitch's columns, and uh, it's totally worth subscribing to. And now they've been bought by the New York Times for $500 million. And Janine says hello from Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism, class of 2004. And who is this Tracy O'Connor? That is my wife. Yeah. <laughs> She's the one I just took to Cameron Indoor Stadium for the Duke Clemson game, and she loved it. And what what an atmosphere! Just not just because it's Coach K's final season, but that is if, if you haven't seen a game there, it, it's worth the trip. Well, she she's implying that she hasn't read all the other books yet. Is that true? Or she's not? never read. I don't think she's ever read a word of any of the previous books that I've written before. And uh, so, but she promises to read this one because she is a college basketball fan. Okay, good to, good to know. I'm the uh, husband of an author myself. My wife has written one book, is uh, completing her second novel. And if I hadn't read uh, it, I would have been in trouble. So uh, <laughs> obviously uh, you folks have a different dynamic. Okay, uh, here is the story we saw about uh, a child that died after falling into a hundred foot well. And you will remember that story in America about baby Jessica from the 80s, Ian. You yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. do. Yeah, that was a, a very profound story for sure. Yeah, and it showed the ability for tragedy to bring people together, as we saw with 9/11 and others. And I saw a comment in here saying that someone who loves playing Wordle, they get up at 12 or they stay awake till 12:05 to play it. Uh, Ellen does uh, play it every night at 12:05 a.m. I presume that's when it drops. And Pradnya says, "I'm going to be mad if they start charging." for Wordle. Okay. Uh, and Jonathan says, Wordle makes me curdle. Very nice, Jonathan. Well done. And uh, here's that story about butterflies and conspiracy theories. And that gives me a chance to ask you about Aaron Rodgers and all these athletes who have conspiracy theories that are ruining their reputations. I don't know if I'd say he's ruined his reputation, Aaron Rodgers. He's hurt his reputation, that's for sure. Uh, and I think also just from a, a, a football perspective, the fact that he keeps losing in the playoffs has not helped his, <laughs> his legacy. He is one of the great quarterbacks ever, but uh, as far as being up there with, with the Tom Brady's and, and even uh, Mahomes, uh, I think he's hurt himself. And, and lying about his vaccination status, I'm sorry. I know he, he said he didn't lie. He misled, but to me that was a lie. <laughs> I think he, 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 he did damage himself. There was no need to do that. It, it's sort of the, a lot of people believe, frankly, Aaron Rodgers is a fairly arrogant person. And I think in that case, he, he did hurt himself and, and came across that way. And sort of the rules apply to everybody else, but not to me. And uh, I, did, I do think he lost quite a few fans over that uh, incident. And he's a great athlete, great player, but that was a big mistake. Uh, we're looking at the arts and leisure section. And uh, wait one second here. The people who told Kaepernick to shut up and play are really quiet about Aaron Rodgers suddenly become one, one of the top scientists in the world. I'm laughing because otherwise you've got to cry about all of the stuff that's happened. And Colin Kaepernick is owed an apology by the NFL, the same organization that now puts end, end racism on the back of their helmets in the end zone, punished him for all he did was the most symbolic of of protest, the quiet protest. He in fact was told to kneel because he was told that that's less of a, that's less provocative. And so he did that. And then look how, what look at the price he paid. We're looking at your 2016 column after Colin Kaepernick first protest and you can not call him Kaepernick, just don't call him un-American. Thank you for saying that Ian. Uh, that's now what people say. And by the way, what about our production team here going back into the archives and pulling out all this stuff? It's pretty cool. Tremendous work. I, I remember, Sri, the day I was driving my son, Kyle, to Syracuse University to help him move in. And I heard on the radio the night before that Colin Kaepernick did not stand for the national anthem. I said to myself, wow, that is a big story. That story is going to have legs for a long time. And it sure did. And 
and people who have, have complained about that protest and the kneeling, right, he, a soldier, asked him to kneel and said that was more respectful. And Kaepernick said, OK, I'll do that. He didn't disrupt anybody else. He didn't break a team rule. He didn't break a league rule. He, he was very quiet. He didn't. If you wanted to stand next to him during the national anthem, fine. If you wanted to sing it, fine. He didn't disrupt anybody. I thought it was a very respectful protest of a righteous. Well, he was he was representing a righteous cause, the systemic and racial inequities in this country, police uh, brutality. And so he paid a heavy price for taking that righteous stand. And I've written a number of columns about that. And the NFL does owe him an apology. And even when Roger Goodell was saying Black Lives Matter and the NFL wouldn't exist without black players, he, he wouldn't even speak his name. He not apologize to him. So I think uh, Kaepernick, the people who supported him, ended up certainly on the right side of history. Thank you. And that's always good to understand that there is that arc of history in and uh, how it bends, the moral arc, as we heard. The end is near. What's your hurry? Let's talk a little bit about pop culture. What are you, do you have time to watch any of these shows? Uh, pod, do you listen to podcasts? What is your entertainment uh, situation? I, I don't, a, a little bit here and there, and basically because I have two full-time jobs, an author and also as a, a sports columnist. And so entertainment at night, some Netflix shows, and, and maybe a little golf on the side. That's that's pretty much about it. And I really do when I'm doing a book anyway. I, I have uh, two full time jobs, so it's tough. Uh, but uh, right now I'm actually again, I, I seem to be uh, the last person in on these things. I'm watching all the reruns of of Homeland, the show. And so then I'll get to uh, the latest season of Ozark. So Netflix has, has been a, a help in terms of catching up on things. But sure. uh, as far as entertainment goes, I just don't have a lot of time for it, unfortunately. All right, uh, folks, you're watching my conversation with Ian O'Connor, fantastic columnist at ESPN who has two jobs. The second job is a best-selling author, and that's appropriate. We're going to go to the book review, and we're going to talk about that. His current book, which is dropping February 22nd, which is Wife Even Will Read, which is the best endorsement, okay. uh, though he has gotten great endorsement from Bill, Bill Blaschke in the Washington Post. In this insightful biography, sports writer O'Connor captures the formative experiences an inner drive that catapulted the coach to icon status. Even the most diehard fans will learn something. And we should say the opposite of that, that even if you're not interested in sports, you're not a fan, you're going to learn things about his, uh, his drive, his leadership style, his communication style. And people pay Coach K a lot of money at Fortune 500 companies to inspire them to talk to them about leadership and things like that. So you're going to be able to get all that wisdom instead of paying him hundreds of thousands of dollars, you'll get it for about 30 bucks from Ian's book or 28, 28 bucks. There you go. Even better. And so, three, by the way, I, I spent almost 11 years at ESPN.com. I've been at the, the New York Post as a sports columnist for the last uh, 10 months or so. One of the best sports sections in the country. In fact, last night, instead of watching the Olympics, I had to cover the, uh, the Knicks Lakers game remotely out in Los Angeles. So, uh, I'm right now focusing a lot on, on New York sports for obvious reasons. And that's where I grew up. And so I'm enjoying that immensely. Well, let's talk for a second about New York sports and your background with the New York Times about your first day at the New York Times. You have a great story. Well, it was I was so stressed out to go work with the greatest journalist in the world at the New York Times as a young man in my in my 20s. And my previous job out of college was at a bureau of the Star Ledger in New Jersey, where I basically did death notices, obituaries, town meetings, local high school and college sports. And uh, Jack Curry, uh, Yuri, uh, Neil is a Yankees fan, so he knows Jack from his pre and post game work on the Yes Network. He had gotten a job in, in the writing program at the New York Times, and I was friends with him. We worked together in New Jersey. So I said, you know, maybe I should apply to that as well. And I did. And it it was a two year program, I believe, at the time. And you came in as a copy boy. I don't think they exist anymore. But basically, you ran around and did errands for the editors and, and writers of The New York Times. And so my first day, I, I just wanted to be perfect. I did not want to make a mistake. I put a tremendous amount of pressure on myself walking in the doors of that building on 43rd Street. Wow, it, it was an experience. And so for eight hours, I was tensed up. 
And I've had a, not that anybody mistreated me. And Carla, of course, was one of the great people I, I, I first met that day. And in the sports department, which I believe was on the fourth floor, the newsroom was on the third. And I've had a migraine headache in my life maybe three times. I'm 57 years old. Well, that night, I had the worst migraine of my life just from the pressure that I put on myself. Not that anybody mistreated me or was overly harsh or draconian, but that's how wound up I was. And I was, I don't want to get into detail here, but I was sick all night. Didn't get a wink of sleep or maybe an hour. And I remember I did not want to get out of bed the next morning and get on that bus and head back to Port Authority and walk back into that building. But I forced myself to do it. And Every day got better, and it was the greatest experience of my life and really shaped me as a, as a sports journalist, as a journalist in general. And just to witness the professionals at work at the New York Times was an amazing experience, and I just learned so much. Lori Mifflin was the deputy sports editor at the time. What a pro. When I think of professionalism in our business, I see her face, and she sat across from me as I was answering phones. I'd get lunch for writers and editors. I would run uh, – layout pages into the composing room. And, and, and then occasionally I, I would get a chance to cover a game, an assignment. And, and back then when you were a, a copy boy or a clerk, they generally did not give you bylines on your stories. And I didn't care. I just wanted to, to write and get a repetition in and to be able to have clips to show to employers down the road. And I was able to do that. But those two years were everything to me. And yeah, that first day is, I, I almost get emotional thinking about that night and just forcing myself to go the next day, which I think is a lesson that I carried with me uh, through the rest of my career. Just don't quit. Whatever you do, just fight through it. And I tried to fight through that and it wasn't easy. I'll also say that uh, I, in my life, I've been blessed to write 40 plus articles, columns for the New York Times and got to spend a summer as an professional intern. I was already a college professor at Columbia and I went to spend two months on a project there. It was an incredible experience in the old building and then in the new building to see it all. And it meant a lot. We're looking at some of your uh, unbi unbylined stories and other things. Yeah. Here's a story about uh, Earl the Goat that you wrote. And this was uh, un uh, unbylined, but you earned the attention of the great sports writer, Frank DeFord. Frank DeFord, arguably the greatest sports writer ever, and was starting a, a newspaper, an all sports newspaper called The National. It was the first time in this country that was attempted. It was really ESPN.com or The Athletic in print before its time. And so he was putting together a staff, and, and I wrote this story on Earl Manigault, New York City residents and, and sports fans know, I think, a lot of them that New York is, is known for its playground legends, players who were great talents, but didn't make it to the NBA for one reason or another. Earl Manigault was among the more famous or infamous of those legends, and he had returned to New York. I found him in a, in a park in the city, and he had a, a very troubled life with drugs. He had done some prison time. And, and so I wrote his life story, basically, in the Times. I was proud that it led the sports page without a byline. And in fact, that, that I think played to my benefit because Frank DeFord – called the New York Times wanting to know who wrote that story. <laughs> so he found out and he had me in for an interview and offered me a job as a basically an entry level reporter at the uh, what would be the National, the National Sports Daily. I went back to the Times and the Times counter offered and said, OK, what we'll do is we'll expedite your two year program and we'll make you a reporter trainee. So we'll cut off the last, let's say it was six months of that program and we'll advance you to the next stage. And unless you screw up in a year as a reporter trainee, you will be a reporter at the New York Times. It was a very tough decision to make. And in retrospect, maybe I made the, the wrong one. But I, because it was Frank DeFord, because he had made me an offer, and because I didn't have to go through that year training period at the National, I, I decided to take that chance. And so I've had opportunities over the years, maybe to go back to the Times, a couple of job offers. It just didn't work out. So uh, but uh, so I've always uh, revisited that decision and I, I guess it worked out OK. But that was a tough one. And uh, that story really helped put me on the map.
And just to remind everyone, the reason it wasn't how it didn't have a byline was because you are a copy clerk and not a reporter. But well, how ridiculous a uh, decision that was. And by the way, you've done pretty well. Uh, you've done really, really well. So uh, no need to be modest there. Let's go back so and look at the picture with uh, Reggie Jackson. Uh, that's pretty cool. And uh, you know, to use the word copy boy, you look a little old there to be called copy boy, but uh, maybe <laughs> you weren't as baby looking as you might have been in this photo. Well, this photo, I was asked to cover, I think this was one of my last assignments at the New York Times in the cover of press conference. Reggie Jackson, I believe, was already retired at this point. And I probably violated about 10 cardinal rules of journalism at this thing because I, I remember telling Reggie that uh, Yankee fans like Neil would know that there was a big rivalry back in the day in the 70s between Thurman Munson, the captain of the Yankees, and Reggie Jackson, his teammate, who was a, a big free agent signee at the time. And uh, I, I told him, I told Reggie Jackson, my brother was a big Thurman guy, but I was a big Reggie guy. And he said, let's take a picture, kid. And we took a picture. And like I said, I would never do that as a grown up journalist. So I probably earned my copy boy designation that day. But I was I was thrilled, obviously, at the time to take a picture with somebody I considered a, a sporting hero. And so, but no, I wouldn't do that today. And I know that this is a this is in the era before selfies, but I also know that Neil was geeking out with this. <laughs> I, I have to jump in here. I obviously I put it up uh, on the screen earlier. Uh, I'll, I'll have to say Thurman was my guy. I still remember uh, when he passed away. I was uh, a little bit younger, but made a huge impression. Uh, but I just want to make one comment about uh, getting that picture. Certainly getting a picture with Reggie Jackson is, uh, is a thrill. I used a, a similar line back before uh, when Mayor Giuliani was more well-respected. I saw him at an event and stopped him and said, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, a picture with a, a fellow Yankee fan. It got it. He wasn't taking pictures with anyone. He stopped, turned around. I got a picture. Uh, I've since burned it, but it was uh, great at the time to to use that use that line. But yeah, this is this is great, Ian. This sure. is absolutely great. And you and you said it was your brother. You and your brother uh, were uh, had different. Um, yeah, we were. We were right? like you, Neil. We were big Yankee fans, but but he loved Thurman Munson. I I didn't dislike Thurman Munson. Sure. Uh, but I, I was more of a Reggie guy. And I well, obviously, when Thurman died, I, I remember, I think Yankee fans of my generation will never forget where they were the day they heard or the moment they heard that Thurman died in, yeah. in the plane crash. And one thing that was really profound to me was that first game back in Yankee Stadium. Do you recall this, Neil, that Reggie, during the pregame tribute to Thurman, was sobbing in the outfield? Mm hmm. And even though they were rivals, I think their relationship had started to get a little better. They were starting to understand each other a little bit more. And it's a shame that it ended when it did. But I, I'll, I'll never forget Reggie sobbing in the outfield. That was a it was a very moving moment. It, it was tough at the very beginning. Um, I want to uh, recall, I'm trying to, yeah, um, your uh, brother, you mentioned your brother passing away earlier uh, from your column. The official time of death was 351. Uh, which can be translated as 1551, uh, um, Thurman Munson's number backwards and forwards, as uh, I believe it was your sister that well, pointed yeah, his, that out. His, his wife, my sister-in-law, Ellen, she pointed that out Sister-in-law. Yeah, and uh, that, was, uh, that really hit me. And, and so if he were still alive, he would have been proud of that or happy to hear that, I guess. But yeah, Thurman Munson, though, uh, he... he the way he led that team and, and carried himself, uh, he meant a lot to, to Yankee fans from, from that generation and certainly to my brother. Absolutely. Sri, I'll, I'll uh, step away now. Uh, I know there are a few more pages of the paper you might uh, try to get to. <laughs> I think we only got to a very <laughs> a tiny sliver of the paper, but I do want to say here that uh, Macron says what people can do if they want to reach out to the Adams administration in New York to work on this badminton angle. Or if anyone who's watching as a sports journalist wants to get in on this, write to Macron Boot. You can find him on Facebook. And look at this lovely comment from Chris Gorman. Ian, I have to run, but just wanted to note that I read your work in the Rockland Journal News when I was growing up and credit it for getting me interested in reading the news. From there, I began to read more and more of the paper and haven't stopped since. Looking forward to reading your book on Coach K. Thank you to Sri and the team for an excellent episode today with Ian. So Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it.
yeah. And uh, and Ian and Chris is at the American Folk Art Museum where he's deputy director and still cares a lot about the news and about the Yankees and so much more. All right, we're going to go back into reading the paper. Uh, we want to show you here the book review and uh, the cover stories about the kingdom of characters and the language revolution that made China modern and red carpet, Hollywood, China and the global battle for cultural supremacy, big, big stories. Uh, and interesting that that's on the front page the day the Olympics or the week the Olympics is running. What are you reading uh, these days? Uh, right now, actually, well, uh, you just caught me reading this uh, headline in the New York Times, uh, U.S. warns of grim toll if Russia pursues full invasion of Ukraine. That is, uh, that's a story that is, is very troubling. Obviously, when you look at the estimates of potential death of civilians, it's, it's the death toll in the United States at 9-11 times 16 or 17, 50,000 people. That is a, wow, I mean, hopes and prayers and certainly... That the last thing the world needs now is a humanitarian crisis of that magnitude. So hopefully there's a diplomatic solution to that to that issue. Folks, I also, yeah, thank you. I totally agree. And uh, we hope we don't end up having war. This is an ad uh, in the paper for this book. Uh, it's called Cooking the No Recipes Recipes by Sam Sifton, who is a fantastic writer. And that entire cooking enterprise of The New York Times, uh, they've done a great job with that. Uh, let's keep going. In here, the world of Bill Cunningham, who obviously did great work on Sundays and more. Uh, let's see here. I'm just going to fast forward to the bestseller list. What does it mean for you that you've had books on the bestseller list, and especially the New York Times bestseller list? It means everything, Sri, and particularly since I started there, as I explained earlier, answering phones at the New York Times for, for some of the great reporters and columnists and editors. So to, to be in that newspaper in any context, in any regard, but particularly on the bestseller list, I've had three. Hopefully Coach K is number four, but it's really tough to make it. It, it is very difficult to make it. And I think uh, the, the Belichick book, when it made it, I want to say it was number 10 and only 15 nonfiction books make it. And every other book on that uh, list seemed to be a Trump book. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so it's, it's, it's hard for a sports book to get on there. Uh, but uh, but it did, and, and I've had three, and, and hopefully Coach K is is the next in line. But uh, if not, I, I will uh, certainly work as hard as I can to promote it, and, and basically, hopefully, people will see it one way or the other as the definitive and most thorough account of uh, great American life. And everybody who's watching right now can help make that a possibility by – uh, pre-ordering it right now from your favorite bookstore and just telling everybody about this and tag your friends, folks. Just tag them right now. They can watch this live or later. As soon as we're off the air, it'll be live. Sorry, the recording will run again on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Let's go into the New York Times Magazine, The Battle to Control the World's Most Powerful Cyber Weapon by Ronan Bergman and Mark Mazzetti. And I'm not sure which cyber weapon this is. I don't know if it's Pegasus or something else. And so I look forward to reading that. That's a dramatic photo here. I'm not sure what the, uh, there's about a blue winged teal. <clears throat> and we'll just go into the paper. And uh, there are so many new food services, as you know, and caviar is actually not that new, but they bring you like only gourmet food uh, delivered to your home. And uh, how did you spend the pandemic? Any sourdough cooking or baking? I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, you're talking to me? No, no, uh, I, I did not uh, engage in that. And uh, there was a whole lot of uh, reading and, and, and uh, writing and, and staying indoors and, and trying to stay safe. And again, we, we had a very difficult experience with the virus. I, I will say, Sri, that my experience with it, the first go around was uh, shaking at night uncontrollably sometimes at my desk. And I didn't even know I had the virus at the time. And I lost about 16 pounds. I couldn't eat. And so that first wave, and we're talking now late March in that first wave, and we still didn't really know a lot about the virus. That was a frightening time for, for us as a family and for me just as an individual going through that. And uh, But got through it after about eight or nine very difficult days, didn't have to go to the hospital. So I was far luckier than, than a lot of people around the world. I know you will enjoy reading this interview with Eddie Vedder the great musician, uh, it's about dealing with loss. 
not everyone is able to get with close friends who have wisdom to impart the simple thing of waking up and trying again. And again, I'm thinking of your brother today, Ian, uh, two years uh, after his passing. Thanks. Ray. And uh, here's the poem in the New York Times. And we're going to keep going here. And uh, here's the ethicist column is something we look at. And the diagnosis, the doctors insisted he had a heart attack. He was certain that that couldn't be true. Who was right? My God, I hope it'll be clear. If I ever have a heart attack, I, I hope it's clear that it's happening. Or maybe it's good if it's so light that you can't tell and that you're the subject of a New York Times medical column. Maybe it's not so bad. I don't know. And uh, how to ski blind is one of the pieces here. And someone's recommending the Garamond font. By the way, in a lot of books, uh, in hardcover books, it's common to tell us about the font that's used. Is, does it, Have your books had that little flourish where you've told us what fonts you've used? Uh, no, uh, I don't think so. The, the, the one complaint I, I've received uh, regarding that or, or close to that is the print sometimes, at least my Belichick book was so long that uh, I got a few complaints about uh, how small the, the type was in that book. So I, I think we rectified that in Coach K. All right, good. This is a play on a French Tigre cake is bigger and adorned with more ganache. Are you a chocolate guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a chocolate guy. It's hard to uh, not be a chocolate guy, I think. Mm -hmm. So I have a bit of a sweet tooth, I have to confess. I need to work on that. Mary O'Connor Stout says, can't wait to read Coach K. Congratulations. So proud of you. Tell us about Mary. Well, she, Mary, that's my sister. She's a, she's a terrific sister. Uh, unfortunately, we lost our sister, uh, Rita, to cancer and I lost, we lost our brother both in their fifties. So they were, their lives were cut short uh, tragically. And so I have my sister, younger sister, Eileen and my sister, Mary, who uh, was the one in the hospital who was touch and go for a while there with, with COVID. Uh, she pulled through uh, very courageously and uh, just a, a tremendous advocate and, and sibling and, and glad she's doing well. I'm glad to hear that. And welcome, Mary. Thank you for watching. And Carla has pre-ordered her book of Coach K, which is great. And uh, this column is about man-eating. It's called The Man-Eater Empire. Sorry, Meat-Eater Empire. I don't know why I said man-eater. And Stephen Ronella says that killing animals can be part of loving nature. How interesting. And so that's a Netflix reality show, I guess. And there he is, loving nature by killing all these animals. I would like to read that and understand what he's talking about. And uh, this is the story about the cyber weapon. Here's a font hard to read, but uh, making a point here about the NSO built a cyber weapon so powerful that quietly transformed Israel's relationship with the world. So this is about Pegasus, I guess. I thought it was an entirely Israeli weapon. Uh, I didn't realize this. So, um, so much to read and understand. And Steve Banks versus homelessness. He was the most effective social services director in New York City history. And when he left office, there were still 45,000 people sleeping in shelters. Is that a success? Important question in New York City as we deal uh, with various issues in the recovery here as well. About crosswords, are you? do you have time for crosswords? Not really. I, I've done a few, uh, not uh, effectively. Uh, uh, that, that's not my, my specialty. Uh, I wish I was better at it, frankly. Sometimes it's embarrassing, uh, my performance uh, with uh, crosswords, but so I, I try to stay away from things I'm not good at, <laughs> and uh, that's one of them. And uh, you'll often find sports items in here. Look at this. It says number 86, regular 86 across is regular at City Field, and that's the big sports uh, stadium. I wonder what it is. 86 across is how many letters? Sorry, here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What could it be? Everyone tell us if you know the answer. Let me just confirm. One, two, three. Yeah, seven letters, 86 across. Regular at City Field. Well, 86 across, 86 is when the Mets won the World Series. So there you go. Got to be related. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, let's let's talk for a second about uh, the topic of not Fox News, but CNN. And what did you make of that entire brouhaha with the stepping down of Jeff Zucker, who was divorced and having a consensual relationship with a fellow divorcee, uh, but... I think his bigger crime, I mean, they've said is that he was uh, advising, the two of them were advising uh, Governor Cuomo during his troubles, which of course they should not have done. But the biggest crime of all that he should pay for and be punished for is building Donald Trump up. Uh, he did it at The at the Apprentice and he did it, uh, of, of course, on CNN itself. So 
Uh, if you have a thought to share, feel free. Otherwise, we can move on. Well, just in, in regards to his uh, stepping down, I, again, it's another case of a leader where the rules apply to everyone else, but but you and that organization didn't report the relationship, which which was required, and, and that that cost him his career. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, there's certainly a, a degree of arrogance there in that decision not to do it, and ultimately it cost him in a big way. Yeah, I see what you mean. I've learned the pronunciation of at least Renati's first name, and this is about who me, a star, the actress Renati Reinsev is stepping reluctantly into the spotlight to find celebrity to be a challenge. Uh, so let's move on from that. And the Sunday Review, In Good Faith, is the cover about the crisis in the evangelical community. And sports Craven and Spotify's Craven Choice to back Joe Rogan's another piece here. And always worth looking at the Sunday Review. And finally, we're looking at real estate. Uh, have you had good luck with real estate, sir? No. <laughs> no. And also being a, a briefly, I was a, a landlord of sorts and, and that wasn't fun. I didn't find that to be a fulfilling experience. So I'm going to try to avoid that as well in the future. <laughs> okay. I understand. You said this is probably a good policy, like avoid, you avoid things that you're not, good, you're at. not good at. Yeah. I found that to be a good formula to follow in life. There are a lot of things I'm not good at. So sometimes it's difficult to sidestep all of them, but uh, I try the best right. I can. We have just a, a few minutes left with you, but I did want to put you on the spot for a fun segment here that we sometimes get to do called the Social Cues Column by Philip Galanz. And this is an etiquette column and there are no right or wrong answers, but I'll pick out a random question, read it to you, and then you'll give us your thoughts on it. And again, don't worry, uh, it's just to embarrass you, nothing else, okay. Uh, let's see. Don't reach out and touch is the question. During a pandemic, I think that shaking hands is gross and unnecessary. Still, people keep introducing themselves to me with handshakes. I was at an up outdoor birthday party last weekend and several people reached out to shake. I know it's a hard habit to break, but what should I do when people extend their hands? Asks Caitlin. And Ian says, I say offer a fist for a fist bump. Or if you feel compelled to shake that hand that's stretched out in front of you, just make sure you quietly go to the bathroom and wash your hands immediately. Don't touch your face. I, I think you have two options there. Neither one's a bad option, but that's what I would do. Okay. And uh, I would do also, I would do a namaste. Uh, it's the Indian way has come, uh, is going to keep us safe, uh, I think. But let's see what Philip says. And his column is fantastic. He says, uh, you may be misunder uh, you may be underestimating how baked into culture handshaking is. When I was a kid, my parents ran handshake drills with my brothers and me. We had to look them in the eye, shake their hands firmly, and tell them it was nice to see them. So I don't blame people for extending their hands out of habit. I don't shake them either. The next time someone does, say let let's put shake hands on hold for now. Personally, I like the small bows of head and upper torso that I see replacing them. Fewer germs and just as pleasant. So that's that's fun. And uh, here Rajan says, agree with Ian about their response to an offered handshake. I also tried to introduce the Vulcan hand salute with limited success. And that, of course, <laughs> is from Mr. Yeah. Spock. And we love that. Namaste working wonderfully across the globe, uh, says Makran. So we're going to start to wrap up here, folks. Our guest has been the incredible Ian O'Connor. We're going to come back to him in just a few minutes. We have some announcements to make. And then he's going to give us a, a pro, pro tip on writing, on sports writing, on journalism that uh, you will all benefit from. So please stay tuned. Please tag your friends right now and we'll give Ian a chance to get a sip of water and we'll come right back to him. Thank you so much, Ian. Thanks, Free. Appreciate all it. right. Uh, let's bring Neil in here as we do our customary wrap up of the episode. What a fantastic episode. Thank you, Neil, for all the time you spent uh, with Ian and uh, and getting those great stories out of him. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah, it was it was really great. And uh, what I liked particularly because we don't usually spend a lot of time on sports, given our audience. But you know, we talked about how sports transcends. You know, that some of the issues he talked about transcend sports. Uh, talking about biographies, authorized, unauthorized biographies. Um, talking about Brian Flores and discrimination, Colin Kaepernick. Uh, the Rooney Rule, all these things that are, you know, part of our, our lives. So it really was great. And, and you know, this biography of Coach K 
looks like it's going to be another uh, bestseller. Uh, we'll see how it, how it does. February 22nd is when it comes out. Uh, a couple of quick announcements for folks. Um, we hope that you'll join us uh, at 1015 uh, Eastern time. We're going to uh, end this show uh, in just a few minutes, and then we're going to start a new show on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website. It's a tribute to Robin Herman. Um, Melissa Litke and Lori Mifflin will be joining us. Uh, Robin was a pioneering uh, sports reporter. She uh, broke barriers um, getting into the uh, NHL locker rooms, um, but ha had such a, a long career as well as a writer. So we're going to celebrate her uh, life and work at 1015 Eastern time. Hope you will be able to join us for that. Next week, uh, Sri Srinivasan is going to be hosting Steve Roberts, uh, Stephen Roberts, uh, who wrote um, uh, Koki, A Life Well Lived, uh, which is really a love story. It's well timed for Valentine's Day, which is going to be the day after next week's show. Uh, so hopefully you'll, you'll join us for that as well. Uh, Sri, you want to uh, make a comment? Um, yeah, I, just wanna, I, yeah, I was just going to say that uh, we are doing this because we want to acknowledge Robin's great career and we wanted to give that a separate a moment, and you heard Laurie Mifflin's name. We'll ask Ian when he comes back to talk just a little bit about Robin and connecting uh, why, even for male sports writers, it made a difference to be able to get into the locker room the way Robin had broken through and made sure that women had access to uh, such venues. And uh, for next week, uh, that's a Koki Roberts's husband. Uh, I had the great uh, honor of meeting Koki multiple times, but I also got to fly with her sort of by accident and then help her uh, navigate the air train in at JFK airport one early morning uh, before she died. She was on her way to Africa to help uh, uh, her favorite charity there, which is an incredible thing. So this is our Valentine's Day special. Dorothy Abbott says, I haven't seen your show before and was fascinated. Thank you. We do this every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. We've been doing this for six years. We're independent of the New York Times. We do this all by ourselves and we love uh, news and newspapering. So it's not only about the New York Times. We talk uh, in, in other episodes. We've done the Washington Post read-along, the, uh, the Toronto Globe and Mail read-along, this the Sun Times read along from Chicago uh, and and so many others. We did a uh, College we, Times as yeah, well. Yeah, Times <laughs> when you were in, in Dubai. Dubai, we've done uh, 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 the uh, Bergen Record read along. Yep. So uh, if you're watching and you're in the newspaper business and you want us to work with you, we'd love to do that. And this is all because we're pushing back against. Uh, fake news and uh, the spread of mis and disinformation. I want to just quickly thank our sponsors, Muckrack. Thank you so much for making this show possible. Uh, we are very grateful. If you'd like to be a sponsor, please reach out to us at sri at digimentors.group or neil at digimentors.group. And also, again, thank our fantastic team that put, puts this together. Paula Kiger at Big Green Pen, Steve Taylor at Steve DeReeve, Julia Weeks at Julia L. Weeks, and Carla Baranakis at Kabara. Speaking of Carla, she has an awesome newsletter that you never want to miss. It's called The Local Connection. Subscribe for weekly story ideas and pro tips for local reporters. You know, anyone who's a journalist in your life, they need to be getting this. It's at bit.ly slash local news tips bit.ly slash local news tips or hit me up and I will send you that link. It's a fantastic newsletter taking the biggest national international stories and how to localize it for wherever you are. Uh, you will definitely benefit from subscribing to this. So with this, uh, we want to remind you about DigiMentors, the company that I am honored to run and work with great people like the folks you just saw, including Neil. And we do these kinds of shows and podcasts for all kinds of people around the world. But we also do events and event and, and book launches and uh, hybrid events now that we're doing. And of course, social and digital consulting. So please do reach out to us if we can work with you. And Roberta Oster says, I love this show. Thanks to Sri and Neil and team and so many great comments coming in, including from Mary. And uh, I think we want to now bring back Ian so that he can give us a pro tip that you might read about in Carla's newsletter in the weeks ahead. So Absolutely. let's bring back Ian. And thank you so much, Ian. You were fantastic. Uh, I had a great time and so grateful to you. So over to you and your, uh, or your pro tip. But first, if you can just mention Robin and what she did for all sports writers. 
Well, Rob, in my entire career, 36 years, uh, I, I did not know a locker room without women in it. So to that, that, that her legacy would be directly connected to the ability of, of women sports journalists to do their jobs in locker rooms, conducting interviews is just amazing. And frankly, the, the best of the best sports writers in the business are women. Sally Jenkins is probably the best sports writer in the country. Christine Brennan, Jamel Hill, Selena Roberts, formerly the New York Times. If you didn't come every day to compete against those people, they were going to blow you out of the water. You, you'd get destroyed. So they're the best of the best. And, and, and Robin's legacy is, again, directly tied to that. And that's a, it's, it's an amazing credit to her and those who were right there with her at the forefront of, of that movement for female journalists just to be treated as equals and, and to see where that, uh, that group of sports journalists is today is, is remarkable. Thank you. Uh, now a pro tip, please. Just, uh, it's nothing profound. I get asked this a lot. Just always make the extra phone call. I think the, the core of all good writing is reporting. And there are people who might be more talented than you are, certainly more talented than I am. But if you don't let others outwork you, that's going to carry you a long way in this business. The biggest story I probably ever got, the last interview George Steinbrenner ever gave, was because I made an extra phone call on a night I didn't feel like making it. And, and so I'd already worked. I was tired. I think I had a, a date with my wife set up. I hadn't seen her in forever because I was working on a book. I made that phone call and it became a huge story. And his final interview, the most famous sports owner probably ever. So make that extra call, outwork people, and you'll be fine. That's that's great. Thank you uh, so much, Ian. Uh, we want to uh, uh, thank everyone uh, for watching and some of the great comments. Uh, uh, Rahadian uh, said, thank you for appearing on the show. Um, he was a, also a copy boy clerk in 87 uh, at the Times. Jonathan says, good show. Uh, Patricia says, thank you. And she'll have to, uh, another uh, awesome episode. Uh, she'll have to watch the replay. Um, we had, uh, uh, and Rahadian says he missed watching the show. Uh, regularly as well. I think we saw Roberta's comment earlier. Um, Rupa uh, says, fabulous show. Uh, Sri's wife, uh, Rupa, so glad you were able to watch today. Um, and uh, and then we, and we'll close with Sri's uh, comment, uh, stopping by for a quick moment from uh, uh, Beverly Hills. So again, thank you very much, Ian. It really was a pleasure having you. Uh, all the best with uh, Coach K um, and, uh, you know, uh, Best of luck. We're, we're looking to see uh, how it's going to land. I'm sure you'll have a fourth New York Times bestseller on your hands. As a reminder to folks, uh, Coach K, the rise and reign of Mike Krzyzewski, uh, of course, the Duke men's basketball coach. And the book is coming out February 22nd. Uh, you can uh, find it um, at readalong.link uh, slash Coach K. Uh, we'll put that uh, link up for you again, just so you have it. Readalong.link. Uh, slash Coach K. And we certainly encourage people to order the book. Uh, you won't be disappointed. Uh, Ian, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Neil and Sri. And if it makes the New York Times bestseller list, this program will have a lot to do with it. So thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.